appreciate the opportunity to be here. But the first thing I'd like to do is call some of my friends to come up here and be with me because I'm going to tell you about just exactly what they did. So if my four friends, yeah, if you could, well, if you could come up here, please. Tume, Yika, Wabang, Pao Yang. While they're, while they're coming up here to join me, part of a program called the Raven Program. But what are the Ravens? 1962, the United Nations declared Laos to be an independent country. So anybody in uniform had to get out. Everybody did, except the North Vietnamese, who of course were building the Ho Chi Minh Trail and making plans to take over the country. Well, where was the resistance? The Lao forces were very small. The only people who really put up a fight were the Hmong. And so, a man by the name of Bill Lair, who was an agent for the, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, went into the country and met General Vang Pao. He said, uh, he says, would you like our help? Would that, be good? would that be good for you? And he said, absolutely, we'll take it. And so it all began. Well, the question then became, became, we have all these fighter aircraft sitting down in Thailand flying every day up to, up to Hanoi and Haiphong. Why don't they come and help out the people up there? Well, if you're going to do that, you have to have what we call a forward air controller, someone to direct the airstrike. Because the fighters come in too high and too fast, and they don't know who the good people are, who the bad people are, where they are, they have to be told exactly where to strike. And so, eventually, the Raven program evolved. And what these were, were very experienced forward air controllers from Vietnam who came into the country in civilian clothes, unmarked airplanes, a clandestine operation. And so it went for the six years. Well, of course, the Laotians were building their own air force. And Initially, it was all Lao pilots. But General Vang Pao realized that that was, that was not what he wanted. He wanted his own Air Force so that he could direct them on any given day to, any, to a target. And so back, I think it was in uh, 1967, the first pilots, the first people went through that program, the pilot training program, down in Thailand at Udor, Royal Thai Air Force Base. Now, I was an instructor pilot for a while, and I understand how difficult it is for a young person to, under, to handle a big piece of machinery like that. And guess what? When you're flying, you can't step on the brake, right? So you can't come to a halt. It's always going to be moving. You have to somehow get that into the heads of the people who understand. It's very difficult if you haven't even driven a car before that. So for the young men who were chosen in those days, four of whom are up here, my good friends, to become Chapa Cows, uh, this was an exceptional achievement. Then, once they got into this fighting, well, it was flying every day, and not just once or twice a day, six times a day, seven times a day. I remember in the uh, spring of 1971, when the uh, North Vietnamese actually got very, very close to Long Chen, they were rocketing us every night, and we were bombing them every day. I personally flew 100 hours in 12 and a half days. Now you do the math, that's actually in the air. For these guys, it happened all the time. This is what their way of life was. It was a difficult and dangerous, dangerous mission. There were, if correct me if I'm wrong, there were 35 people who went through the program to become Chapacau. Only 17 actually were able to come to the United States. The rest of them, unfortunately, were killed. Now in our program, to give you some idea, the Raven program had the highest loss rate of any Air Force unit in Southeast Asia. Our loss rate was about 12 and a half percent. We lost, I lost eight friends in the year that I was there at Long Chen. These guys lost over 50 percent 
of their people. And yet they went back day after day after day after day. I want to tell you a cute story. I was very pleased to see the picture of General Vang Pao back up here, once again looking over my shoulder, which he hasn't had the chance to do for a long, long time. When I flew into Long Chen on my first day, we, we flew during the day, we landed, flew a couple times, came back, and my boss said, we're going down to General Vang Pao's house. I was very, very impressed because I'd heard all about this man. And I wanted to impress him from the start. So I'm from Minnesota originally. I come off the farm. You know, my history is very different from, from these guys. But I was practicing. So I knew to do, you know, Sabaidi. And I knew that the, that the, the higher in rank, the higher your hands went until the king was up here, you know. So I figured he was about two inches below the king. So I practiced. And we went down to the house for dinner that night, and this gentleman says, General Van Pau, I'd like to introduce a new raven, Craig Deer. I put my hands up in the air. He shoved his hand out to shake my hand. So I brought my hand down to shake his hand. He put his hand. So we did this a while. He grabbed my hand with both of his hands and said, welcome, raven. And that was my introduction to this great man. Well, as time passed, and I won't go into a whole lot of details, uh, there, it became a, a war much bigger than people thought. Let me give you some examples. There was more tonnage of bombs dropped on Laos than any other country in the history of the world. We usually tell people more than on Germany in World War II. The equivalent was 1,500 pounds of explosives for every man, woman, and child that lived in that country. This was a huge, huge operation. When it all came, when it all fell apart, it was because, frankly, the United States decided to pull out, and the support for General Vang Pao and his troops <coughs> dwindled to a halt. And we all know what happened after that in 1975. But let's look back on a couple of numbers. In, uh, between 1962 and 1973, the Hmong held back the North Vietnamese Army, starting at 7,000 troops and ending up at 70,000 troops. During that period, 35,000 Hmong were lost in battle, which is the equivalent of the United States losing 16 and a half million people during the war in Southeast Asia. So put everything into relative terms. Uh, after the war, 130,000 Hmong escaped to Thailand. So this was all starting in 1975. There were three camps down in Thailand where most everybody went and a lot of people have their own personal stories. But what happened back in the United States, several things were going on at the same time. One was there was a limitation on the number of people who could come into the United States. That had to be removed. I'm not exactly sure how it was done. I'm not exactly sure who was involved, but eventually that was lifted. And about the same time, I got a phone call through the Air Commando Association saying, we need to get these people out of the country quickly. The camps are filling up. Can you sponsor one person in your home? And this is how it was done. And I had just moved to a new assignment and I was selling my house. And I said, well, no, I'll tell you what, I know how closely knit the Hmong families are. I'll break, I'll give you the house for as long as you need it. I'll make the payments, don't worry about it. All I need to do is get the church, the local church to sponsor them, which was very common. And so our good friend came over with, with his family with his mother, with his wife, his two children, his sister, and they lived there until within a few years, he had a wonderful job, and he moved on and bought his own house, and then I was able to sell mine. And I think that story was repeated around the country, and I suspect if I have a chance to talk to people later on here in North Carolina, I would imagine that that same hospitality was extended to the people now who we see here sitting under the tent and around. There's a lot, there's a lot to learn from that.
want to, uh, before I go, the question comes, how well do people assimilate into a new culture? Some do well, some do not do well. But I'm going to read something to you you may not have seen. You know there was an election last week? I don't know if you heard about it. It was on all the television channels. You couldn't get away. Well, we picked this up off the internet from uh, Professor Lee Pao Tsiong from Wisconsin. He says, great election night for candidates who are of the Hmong descent who sought elective offices throughout the United States. In Minnesota, we elected five individuals of Hmong descent to the Minnesota House of Representatives and two judges to the ju judicial branch in Ramsey County. That's up in Minneapolis. We also elected one person of Hmong descent to the judicial branch in North Carolina, one mayor and one city council member of Hmong descent in California. Congratulations to all the winners. And think, in 1975, they said the Hmong would not be able to survive in America. And so they were excluded from resettlement. If it weren't for people like Lionel Rosenblatt, Mac Thompson, Jerry Daniels, and I'll say people like Bill Lair, who saw our potential and took a chance on us, we would not be here to enjoy this success. Most importantly, if it weren't for the sacrifices of our veterans and individuals like General Vang Pao, we would not be here either. I mean, that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to say, and it's proof positive. I want you folks who are older to make sure that the young people who are waiting here to dance and whatever else, that they understand their culture, that they know their culture, and that they build on their culture. Because you are, you are totally, totally unique. I consider you like family, and I hope you do the same for us. One final word. One, the other day I was watching a movie. It's called The Four Feathers. It's a book that's been out for many, many years. It's a British book. And at the very end of the movie, they said some words and I had to look them up online to find the script. And I want to tell these four gentlemen right here exactly what they said. For those who have journeyed far to fight in foreign lands, know that the soldier's greatest comfort is to have his friends close at hand. In the midst of battle, it ceases to be an idea for which we fight or a flag. Rather, we fight for the man on our left, and we fight for the man on our right. And when armies have scattered, and when the empires fall away, all that remains is the memory of those precious moments that we spent side by side. Thank you for having me here. Happy New Year, everybody.